two friends, Alan Dale and Jerry Carew, who grew up just a few streets apart in St. John's East End, have been separated by Canada's geography for three decades. They came together virtually during the pandemic to chat about like-minded interests. Alan lives in PEI and Jerry in Newfoundland. Thriving in remoteness has been a common theme for both of them during the pandemic. Gail Force wins. The podcast is the result. Hi, and welcome to Gale Force Winds. Uh, I'm Alan Dale, and with me as always is Jerry Carew. How are you, Jerry? I'm doing very well, Alan. Just coming off the break, uh, and I got a really good break. Lots of time with family. That's which, great. as you know, uh, a lot of the conversations we've had over the last uh, little while is about being in the moment. Well, I tell you, I was in the moment with my family. Good. How's the weather in Newfoundland? Uh, today, uh, well, you know, <laughs> we have had very little snow. Yesterday, we had a whopping about eight centimeters of snow, and it's going up to eight or nine degrees for the rest of the week. So uh, I actually went out with the snowblower just to see if it worked. <laughs> well, good for you. Well, listen, we're quite excited here on Gale Forest Winds uh, uh, today yep. to have a very special guest. Uh, you know, when I uh, think on leadership and I look at uh, what it means to inspire and motivate people, one thing that always comes to mind for me is an ability to have, you know, common sense and use your common sense and, and not take yourself too seriously and, and have some good perspective on things. You know, I remember Jerry and I, when we both joined the Navy, uh, we were always taught, have some common sense, fellas. That's going gonna, gonna to help you through. And we were always told that, you know, if you need help with that, you got to go see one group of people. They, they'll help you out. And uh, as a young officer, that was tough to do. And I'm sure you recall that, Jerry. It was tough to go see the chiefs and petty officers as a young officer and, and ask for help. Uh, but indeed, they did help and help us a great deal. They did because they did have a lot of common sense. And they brought that perspective to the table that we needed as young officers to succeed. So tonight is really extra special for us, really. It is to have the top Chief Petty Officer in the Royal Canadian Navy, join us on Gale Force Winds. And now, 35 years ago, if Jerry and I had been put in a room with the top Chief Petty Officer <laughs> in the Royal Canadian Navy, well, we wouldn't have been so relaxed, let's just say that. But tonight, we're a little bit more relaxed. we got a few more gray here, and we're okay with the conversation. So, welcome to Gale Force Winds, Chief Dave Steves. Dave, tell us a little bit about yourself. Al, Jerry, thank you very much. It's good to be here. Uh, first and foremost, I'm still on leave. So uh, the first time I saw my tie in my shirt for a little bit, and it's, uh, <laughs> it seems to have shrunk over the winter time. but uh, that's all good. That's, that's part of the isolation and the celebration. <laughs> Listen, I, I like to think I'm a laid-back dude. I joined the military of the Navy in Stony Creek, New Brunswick, when I was 18 years old. Didn't know how long I was going to do. Then I was a lifer. I said, I'm doing great, great till 55. I love sailing. Love the ships, love the camaraderie, and by some miracle, here I am, the top dog in the RCN and the Chiefs Corps, and I, I haven't loved every minute because, you know what, sometimes life happens, but it's been an outstanding career, and I like to tell people that I used to say I lived two lives. Well, I'm pretty sure I've lived three now, being in the Royal Canadian Navy for 32 years. Wow, that's fantastic. So, Stony Creek, New Brunswick, good Atlantic Canadian boy. You walk into that recruiting center. Is that in Moncton? It was in the Eaton Shopping Center in Moncton. Yeah, upstairs. There you go. Upstairs, the Eaton Shopping Center. Yeah. How old were you when you walked in? Well, I first signed up, actually. I started the process when I was 17, so I had to have my parents' uh, permission as well. So that's when it started, and I eventually got enrolled. I got in trouble, too, because I took time off of school to go do it. And I told them, I said, I'm going to join the Navy. They're like, yeah, okay, buddy, whatever. I said, no, really, I am. They said, well, you have to be in class. I said, I'm not going to be, so over to you guys. Anyway, I, uh, I failed that paper. But uh, here I am 32 years later. Wow. <laughs> so 17 years old, you're in the recruiting center in Moncton. What's going through your mind? Like, wh wh what, do you, what do you think? How is this all going to play out for you? Not a bloody schmack to tell you. No. <laughs> the only, so I had my best friend in grade 11. Hung around grade 10, grade 11, then he moved. So we're different schools. So I'm wandering around the flats, the hallways, kind of figuring what I'm going to do and find some new friends. And lo and behold, I saw four acquaintances. So I started hanging around with them. They were all on sea cadets. So I was a 
pretty big muscly dude at the age of 17 joining sea cadets bear marching not knowing what i was doing <laughs> but uh, after a year of that you know and being in process for joining uh almost a year to the day off i went to basic training in cornwall so that's it's no big history i didn't join for queen country or anything i just you know what these are my buddies i'm gonna do it it's uh, it's great pay it's great pension and you know what it's gonna make me into a decent person so that's uh that's why i joined so you joined the Navy to see the world, and you got as far as Cornwallis. That's not too yeah. far. <laughs> but it was a nine-hour train ride from Moncton, so I got to see a lot of the back hills there by Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. <laughs> Off you go, and that's fantastic. You know, it's interesting that Jerry's got a boy about to join the Navy at the age of 17. Yeah, Jerry? Yep, 17. Yeah. Right. And my boy joined last year at the age of 16. So, oh. uh, and he's been in now almost a year. Uh, he's a NAFCOM, and I think, Jerry, your boy's going on as what? Uh, you know what? He hasn't really made his decision yet, so uh, we're, we're looking at it. He, he wants to go down in the career in Civvy Street as a, a master mariner. That's his goal. So I couldn't help but say, you know what? I think the Navy is the place for you to go. Join the reserves. Get a sense of what it's all about. I mean, it served you and I very well, Alan. 100%. And it's funny, you know, when I when I talk to my son about he's in grade 12 now and what's next for him, we talk about university and, and, and things like that. And uh, he said to me, Dad, he said, I think I, I want to be an enlisted guy for a while. I want to get something. He referred to it as street cred. He said, yeah. I want to I want to learn the ropes. And, and that's fantastic. I thought that was just a fantastic thing for him to say we're very you know we're very excited as a family to have our son join the navy and as a dad you can only imagine what it's like and jerry i know that you'll go through that too so chief you you went you, you all kinds of ships i read through your bio it seemed every ship you were on you decommissioned so you <laughs> <laughs> which is an experience in of it, on of itself right i mean there's something about a ship it's a it's a living breathing entity and to see it come to the end of its life its, its service to its country is an emotional thing would you agree it's incredibly sad because you know what we always call them she but there are warmth there are comfort she keeps us safe when we're out there to see she nurtures us and it's just amazing and you become part of it and if you're a real diehard like i was and like i'm sure you are it, the ships have a soul the ships have a soul, so one to see them paid off is sad. But I know they can't watch the videos of the one that they are sinking for artificial reefs because it's yeah. just too it's just too hard on the old heart. Even though I know it's good for the environment and building yeah. up and whatnot, but it's just it's it's tough. I love the old girls, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's something about them, eh? And the old steamers, they were. Uh, I don't know. There was some. There's something you walked through them. There was just a little. You were in history there, and it, we really yeah. felt good. You know, a, a guy like you now, you've lived the Navy your whole life. What's your, what's your best kind of, what's your best memory of the Navy? What was your best day in the Navy? Well, this was going to be, what, 10 to live. I've got to say my best day is when I got my C1s, when I got promoted to Chief Petty Officer First Class. Because I've had, uh, you know, issues or run-ins in the past and whatnot. <laughs> I'm not a squeaky clean dude. So when I got that promotion... I ran into the heads and I was uh, while well, I was ashore and I was looking in the mirror and I started dancing. I started to dance. I couldn't <laughs> believe it. I was so excited. But then I realized that there was somebody behind me. <laughs> but it, it, it didn't matter because you know what? I was just so excited. So excited. Tell, tell the truth, crazy. Chief. You went in and shed a few tears now. Tell the <laughs> truth. Didn't you? I've, uh, I've shed many a tear over my life, but you're freaking. Yeah. Well, you know what? Not right then, Jerry, because it took a while to sink in. Like it's so huge, right? But yeah, when it sinks in, it's a. Uh, yeah, it's a tearjerker. I mean, that's a huge accomplishment. I mean, it must have been overwhelming. It was overwhelming. Yeah, absolutely. And well, another great day, actually. And I just, uh, well, I guess the message is out. Uh, again, with my past, you know, somewhat, I've made mistakes in my past. But Art McDonald, the, the Kraken now going CDS, he had me written up for the member, member of military merit. So I actually got accepted. And I just got found out in December I'm getting it. Wow. I couldn't, I couldn't talk. I could, I was speechless. Yeah. Speechless. That, that's just, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, congratulations on that. That is well, incredible. Thank you very much. Yeah. What's it like working with art? <laughs> it's, yeah. <laughs> well, somebody in the past, when, before we got hooked up again, we worked for four weeks at West, they said, man, 
you guys shouldn't really work together. You just, you're too hyper and you're too, you're too crazy together. Yada, yada, yada. We've been together for another 18 months. You know what? Art's a good old down home boy. It's awesome. It's hard, awesome to see New Waterford represented in the Kraken's office now going up to the CDS. Yeah. <clears throat> but that, that is one devoted man. Yeah. I couldn't keep up with them if I had to. Not with a, uh, you know, a rocket pack and steroids. Like the guy's just, he's on a different level of ability, I'm telling you. Yeah, 100%. They are, it's something I, I, uh, I had sailed with Admiral McDonald back in Vancouver and again in Montreal, and we did our ORO course together. And there's something about Art when he arrived on board Vancouver as a sub lieutenant you kind of knew he was going to be CDS. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody knew. Anyway, enough about art. So, okay, that's your best day uh, in the Navy. Tell me about, and, and this is a, a more complicated one, but tell me what, what would you mark as your worst day in the Navy? What would that have been? Well, my worst day in the Navy was probably December 18th. Uh, we've lost, it's been a horrible year for the Canadian Armed Forces and the Royal Canadian Navy. We lost several, as you know, uh, so we met Fredericton on the way back, but they had had three months to mourn and try and get over it. But now with the loss of Dwayne Earl, Master Sailor Dwayne Earl, we flew out and we met the uh, Winnipeg and your emotions were so raw. It was, yeah, it was, a, it was a punch in the throat to see his 10 year old child there, 10, seven year old, his ex-wife, his family, his new wife. It was just, it was horrible, uh, Al. It was yeah. just such raw, unadulterated emotion. It was just, yeah. Yeah, that is sad for sure. And uh, wow. You know, uh, yeah, uh, where do you go with that? We just had a, uh, we just had a Silver Cross mother on uh, two weeks ago and uh, very, you know, Canadians, they, they understand what the military is doing, but I don't know, they fully get it sometimes. And, and when you hear stories about, you know, young folks and, well, just folks being lost in the service of their country. It's hard. It's hard for Canadians. It's hard to, to be. Thanks for doing that. Thanks for representing all of us there on the on the ship uh, for Dwayne's family. Jerry, that's pretty emotional stuff, eh? Oh, man. Uh, I'm just, you know, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, uh, Dave. As a young fella, you know, there was a time when, as Alan alluded to in the beginning of this, is that, uh, you know, you're a young officer cadet. Officer Cadet is, uh, is a challenging position to be in because <laughs> you're not really anywhere. <laughs> but um, I know that the chiefs of the day, very helpful, but at the same time as a young fella, you know, it can be very intimidating. Um, I sense in you um, a leadership that is, you don't mind showing your emotion. Um, could you just talk about that a little bit? And, and, you know, do you ever worry that if you show some emotion that then the troops don't think you're strong enough? Let's, let's talk about that. I really like that kind of conversation around leadership. Absolutely. And it's, uh, let's go back to the beginning. Like I said, leadership has changed a lot. Like we didn't go see the me's back then because you would be scared crap us. You would walk 10 miles just to get out of the way of the chiefs back then. <laughs> But I mean, I tell you, and I'm going to get off track because I have the brain of a squirrel, so please bring me back. But I, I got emails. I got an email the other day from a, a sailor third class, you know, the old ordinary seaman. And she says, I hope it's okay that I'm writing you. Because I had sent out a Christmas message and I spoke of my, my emotions, my depression, and my, my anxiety. And this S3 in the reserves, well, she has published or co-published 12 different novels, 12 different books. And winning, and winning bestseller titles and whatnot. I'm like, well, you know what? The old days, this would never happen. But she felt, just because she, she seen me, be approachable. You have to be approachable nowadays. And, I mean, who am I to criticize this S3? She's way more qualified than I could ever be. But that's the kind of people we have to be. I said, yes, please, use your chain of command. But you know what? My door is always open. And, and you have to be that way. So the first time I really spoke about my depression and anxiety is because I had a really bad spell about four or five days, couldn't get off the couch or anything like that. And I was base chief. Uh, and I spoke about it and I broke down in front of everybody. And then the room went very quiet. And then they all applauded. I'm like, well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not looking for applause. I'm just kind of cry for help, actually. I'm being selfish a bit. 
But you know what? We've changed. We've matured. They appreciate it. And even now, I still get, I still do videos and talk. And yeah, it is emotional. It absolutely is emotional. But, uh, and somebody quoted me, if I can help one person, then it's all worth it. It's absolutely all worth it. And I'll go back to, sorry, just when I was there for the ramp ceremony for Stalker 2-2 and for Dwayne Earl, it's a different, it's, my body automatically goes to a different place. I know it's crushingly painful and everything else, but I almost, I go numb at the same time. And then after the fact, I'm, I'm exhausted because it's just run the gamut of emotions. And I'm sure that's a lot. Uh, it's a lot the same for a lot of people. It's just automatic. It's like when you step on the brow and you're going for 18 months, or sorry, eight months, six months. It's horrible getting there. But let go one, two, three, four, five, six. You're into a new mode and let's get her done. Right, yeah. It's, uh, it's remarkable that you're able to show your emotions and be vulnerable. Jerry and I often talk about the importance of being vulnerable, uh, you know, and, and what the response you get when you are, when you do open up to people and let them come inside and that uh, young sailor third class, you can imagine how tough it was for her right, um, to reach out to you to, to kind of, you know, to make the connection. She was being vulnerable too. And I mean, what a fantastic response you gave to her. Like, it's okay. You're safe here with me. And that's kind of what I led into this about, right? I mean, there's something about as a young officer, being around the chiefs you kind of felt safe you kind of felt okay everything's gonna be everything's gonna be okay here right and uh it's just because the experience and everything plays through you know uh the navy has been wonderful for you obviously i mean you've had a wonderful career what, what are the other things that kind of make you tick is there music are you a musician is, is there anything like that in so i just got a guitar i can't play a lick i'm gonna try because uh retirement's probably what, 18 months away now-ish. Yeah. So uh, I'm not going to do my 55 because my wife, she's being released medically. So I'm going to go three, four months after her in 2022. And again, the, I'm telling you, the, the blues fests that we used to do in Nova Scotia, because Nova Scotia is, selfishly speaking, you know, I'm in the Brunswick by, by, by birth, but Nova Scotia has the best blues fests around. And we probably go to eight, nine, ten every summer with that little twelve-inch, uh, twelve-foot pop-up trailer, hoping to, hoping to be able to upgrade a little bit on that. But uh, we just want to go and enjoy life. We have a we have a little old house down on Bear River, Nova Scotia. I just, you know what? I I want to get away from people for a while. Mm-hmm. I've, uh, I've I've peopled a lot. I've peopled a lot, and I'm just want to go off the grid for a little bit when I retire. You'll get you'll, you'll achieve you'll achieve that in Bear River. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, Dave, I I've been in sales for thirty years, so you know it's funny. Uh, when I come home, I need to get away from people, not my family, but just it needs to be an oasis. Uh, I get all of my social at work. I don't need <laughs> to be out on the front lawn talking to all the neighbors. Not that I'm not neighborly, but. It's like holy shit, man! I've been I've spent a lot of time talking to people today. Don't need to talk more. So I understand where you're going with that. Yeah, hey, you know, Jerry, I'm glad you brought that up because totally different jobs. And but you have to be on every minute of the day, and that is absolutely exhausting. And it's even more exhausting once you turn it off because that's when life comes and gives you a little bit of how she going, boy. Yeah. 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 So in terms of leadership within the the the, the Navy. Um, you know, I'm sure there's still some of the old school. I encountered it. I spent two years in the uh, car business. And frankly, I really encountered some old school leadership there. Very aggressive, demanding. And I, 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 I still struggle with all of that because, you know, you read books about Bill Gates or Steve Jobs or Elon Musk. These are aggressive guys. Yeah. But you know, it seems to me that just in talking to you, that the the Royal Canadian Navy has, has shifted a little bit, you know, or maybe a lot. Yeah, absolutely. We're really, you know what, the days of just yelling and screaming at people, a lot of times they didn't know exactly what they were doing. We have to, we have to win people over. And you know what, I wished 30 years ago, I had had the option to ask, hey, why are we doing this? without the threat to fear of reprisal, which we would have gotten. 
now you know what these young I was gonna say, but they're not all young, the new recruits, the new sailors, holy crap are they impressive. Like I said before to other people, I thought I was the bee's knees. I thought I had her all figured out. But I watched the recruits coming in nowadays, I'm nothing. I wouldn't have stand, stood a chance next to them. I wouldn't have made it to this level competing with them. So why the heck would we not answer the five W's and maybe get even a little bit of input from them, no matter what level? Because you know what? They think differently than us, and that's a, that's a good thing. Let's make this a team effort. And they want to have their voices heard. And why not? They deserve it. It's different, isn't it? It's a, it's a different caliber of person, or maybe it's not a different caliber of person. Maybe it's just people are a little bit different. People want answers. They want you to explain things to them. And uh, basic training used to be about, here's what you got to do. Just do that. Right. But now it's more about explaining, you know, here's why we do these things. And, and I think that there's a heck of a lot more onus right now on leaders to, to kind of explain things to people and, 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 inspire right inspire yeah. them and, and motivate them and that's challenging right that that's challenging as a leader it absolutely is challenging and i've always stated that I, this always comes out wrong i said i don't care if you like why we're doing something i do and i would like everybody to but that doesn't always happen as long as you understand why right. we had the ships out west uh, during the, the kickoff to the covid in the summer they did the uh oh geez i'm gonna use the old term the camp fleet uh, combat X, I'm, I'm using the old term, but they were out doing exercises for 59 days. They're like, ah, oh, the, the fleet exercise never ended. And a lot of them are like, what are we doing? We're not doing the right round of training. We're not getting this. We're not getting that. But the one thing they had to understand is the chief of defense task order at that time was stay healthy, stay ready. So they had to remain isolated in order to be able to re be ready for ready duty ship or to respond to any task called upon, you know. But at the same time, you're not just going to do circles and watch movies. You're still, still going to be doing training. So it is, it's, it's a very delicate balance, right? It's especially when you're off the shore, you're, hey, there's my house. Oh, oh come back around. Oh, there's my house. So it's tough. The leadership is challenging. It absolutely is. And the one thing I want to, I'll end off with here for this portion. People always say we're multi-generational right now. How do you lead four different generations? Don't, don't be a butthead. That's just, just be nice to people. Right. Treat people like you want to be treated. Right. Listen to them, allow them to have some input. And even if you don't use the information, that's fine. They've had their say. Just freaking be nice to people. It's pretty easy at the end of the day. Yeah, for sure it is. And, and you know, the name, and the, our country has changed so much since the time you joined the Navy. I mean, the, the country is this beautiful mosaic of cultures and uh, genders. And, and, and I mean, Canada is a beautiful place to be. There's no doubt about it. I mean, you know, having traveled around the globe, that we have something very special here. How do you reflect that mosaic in the Canadian, for, in the Navy? How do you do that in the Navy? Like, how do you accept everybody in in these kind of rigid regimental hierarchical system where the customs and traditions have gone on for so long, you know, it's so deep and so entrenched and, and you're at the pointy edge of this thing, right? You're, you're the chief, you're at the pointy edge of this thing. You've got to make all of this work. How do you do that? That is a great question. And I'm going to focus on to begin with on one portion you, you mentioned traditions, traditions. Well, what are traditions? Some are good, some are bad, some are excuse, excuses just to be buttholes. And I said buttholes, I'll say it again, because so many people hold on to the old traditions, but you know what? It doesn't mean they're right. We have to change. We have to change how we lead. We have to change how we learn. Like it's a listen, learn, act. We all have to do this, and we have to continue to do it every day. I don't know about every culture out there, but you know what? When I come across people, I'm going to darn well try and learn it. And I've had a few people reach out after me and the crack and did our video against uh, racism and hate and everything else. It It's there. It's there. So we have to weed that crap out. Systemic, be it one person, be it more. We can't have that in our ranks. It's absolutely poisonous. And just, people say, wow, you know, he's a nice guy or she's a nice girl. She didn't really mean that. You know what? It erodes operational effectiveness. If you're excluding one person that deserves to be here, that other person's got to go. So yeah, it's absolutely tough, but we have to change it. Some people from the Indo-Asia Pacific, they're sitting there, look at me when I'm talking to you. Well, it's 
when they're looking to somebody higher, it's automatic for them to look down. So you're right. We have to educate ourselves in order to be able to lead better. And are we going to get it wrong? Absolutely. But like one individual from the uh, GBA Plus mentions, you know what? Let's fail forward. Let's not mess up, make a mistake, and then just quit. No, we need the multiculturalism of Canada represented in the Canadian Armed Forces. We're a Canadian Navy. So do not be afraid to make a mistake, but learn from it and carry on. Absolutely. Yeah, that's fascinating. Because the, the ship is the ship, the armed forces, what have you. I mean, it's a, it's a tight little unit that re, you rely so heavily on one another. No one person in that mix can feel left out, right? And, and to be able to kind of make everybody part of the team and see where they fit in, no matter where they came from. That's remarkable. That's a remarkable thing to be able to achieve. Congratulations on that. I know I was reading through some of your things, you know, one of the, your mantras or thing that you often tell uh, young sailors, older sailors, and maybe even tell the officers, I don't know. <laughs> but leave, leave the Navy better than you found it, right? Talk to me a little bit about that because I got to tell you, I believe in that statement. I really do. I'd like to hear what your thoughts are on that. So one thing, we, thank you. One thing we never used to do in the Chief Corps is, you know, I'm, I'm not overall in charge, but I'm heavily involved in succession managing, succession planning the other chiefs. So I actually call them and I'll tell them, it never used to happen, believe it or not, what I believe their faults are. Because I want to build a pool so people can replace me. When I fall down, when I get out, whatever, I don't want somebody to step in this cold. I want to prep them for as much as possible and I have them ready to jump in. And I think I squirreled and I forgot what you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I squirreled, I forgot what your question was. Oh, oh the, the question was around, um, well, there's succession planning in there, but it, it was more really a comment around how – like your perspective on leaving the organization ah, better yeah. than you found it, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, like the army, the army uses the expression never pass a fault and, and all of those things. And, and I, like, I like what you're saying. Like you leave it better than you found it. You go into a space on the ship, you walk out of there and it's better than you walked in. It's cleaner. It's something's different about it, right? Talk to me a little bit about that. That's absolutely correct. And I never wanted to use don't pass a fault, never pass a fault, because that was army. So when I was Cox and mine was, it has not always been that way. Right. Isn't that your thing you get? So we're doing rounds. I'm like, well, where's that T-bar for the escape hatch? Oh, you know what? That's been gone forever. It's just always been that way. And they would catch themselves. <laughs> we're taking out the basket out of refit. We're coming down the ladder. Everybody holds on to the safety bar. And I say, stop, stop. This is all my charge, right? Seven chiefs of the park. I said, what did you notice? What do you mean? I said, it's covered in tape. The bar you each one just touched. Oh, shit. I didn't even know it's talking. It's always been that way. Yeah. <laughs> just because it's always been that way doesn't mean it's right. So I actually put a numerical value. I say when you leave the CAF, when you leave the RCN, each posting, just make it 0.1% better. Because you know what? That's not. 0.1% is easy. That might be smiling at somebody saying, hey, how you doing? or helping somebody out or mentoring them or coaching them. But it's so easily achievable that each, if each and every one of us do that, out of 101,000 people, man, we're going to be even better than we are today. And it's so easy, so easy. Jerry, you don't see that everywhere, do you? <laughs> people leaving the place better than they found it. <laughs> No, but it's certainly where I think, you know what, leadership needs to be. You can't be protecting space and, and making sure that, uh, you know, the people. Are, a man came up to me one time, very, very successful Newfoundland businessman who's since deceased. He said to me, he said, Jerry, uh, uh, surround yourself with people that are smarter than you are. And I think I've seen leaders not do that. And boy, do I ever despise those types of leaders. You know, that's not where you want to be. But I, I, talking about leadership, uh, Dave, um, you know, during the pandemic, I, I know what I've been through. And I, I would call myself one of the most stable individuals, just been blessed with a real even keel, worked hard on that. Um, but there were times during this pandemic where I was like, 
very unsure of my footing. Um, I have two young boys that I have to be strong for. I can only imagine, you know, for people, I mean, like yourself, I thought a lot about leaders and not just, you know, leaders like yourself who have so much responsibility. What have you done to be able to get through that in this period of time? It hasn't always been easy, like you say, you know what, and it, I think it's getting tougher now because as the end gets closer, just like when you're out for a 10K run and you got to use the washroom, well, those last 10 steps, you're a, you're in a dire straits there trying to hold on. It's the exact same thing now. It's been absolutely tough. And it's actually, it's kicked my butt, I tell you. Right before Christmas, I came up as close as I have, and I don't want to say nervous breakdown, but I was messed up hard. Thank goodness. And I'll tell you, it's, it's evident in everybody. There's not, never in my career have I heard more people say, I need vacation. It's always like, oh, I got leave coming up. It's going to be good. I'm looking forward to it. So many people say, no, no, I, I need it. I need vacation because it's just been a different beast. It has been a different beast. And leaving throughout it is tough because especially Chiefs, especially for myself, I love to go out and see the troops and the, the scale is right till it's hard. I did some video calls. I've done some phone calls. I'm closely engaged with my chiefs as well because I have you know, 108 of us across the country and reminded them, you might be doing fine, but I guarantee you there's somebody within your ranks that is not. And I just learned from this the other day, we're so focused on taking care of somebody else. Everybody else, that one of my C1s is like, well, nobody contacted me because I'm the contact door. I'm like, oh, okay, lessons learned. And we have to learn from this and we have to keep going because uh, we're not done yet. Especially in lockdown here till the 23rd, right? So, yeah, it's remarkable. I mean, that in essence is what a chief is, right? You're here, you are, you're constantly worrying about the, the sailors, and, and there you got a chief that everybody's forgetting about him. He's the guy, kind of, yeah, it, it's remarkable to think. And that's true leadership, though, right? That's sacrifice. That's what that is in a, in a nutshell. Um, okay, so. You know, okay, you've been around, you told me that you're not probably, you know, being uh, squeaky clean your whole career, safe to say. And, you know, and let's be honest, I mean, you're not going to make it to that rank being squeaky clean. You got to have a few dust ups along the way. What's your best story? Best story I, I, in the Navy. I got it. You know what? Sorry, I got to throw this in there. I always used to say to some of the people under me, I said, look, you're not playing the game of hockey unless you're in the penalty box once in a while. It's <laughs> a good Canadian analogy. And the young kids would look at me like, yeah, they have to get put in the penalty box to really figure that one out. But anyway, go ahead. I don't know if this is my best story, but I'll tell you what it is. It's an example of somebody, it was a warrant officer who turned out to be one of my best wingers on board when I was coxswain. And coming in, and he's like, man, I don't know about this Navy thing. Man. Never done it, never sailed. And all his, his mates were like, don't do the duty coxswain thing. They're going to make you stand duty watches. Just get this tour over with as soon as you can. And he fell directly under me as well. I was a coxswain. So, you know, I talked to him and trying to coach him, mentor him. And then we go to sea for the first time. We slip on a Thursday, and he's on the upper deck watching this orchestrated maneuver and it's just amazing getting a ship off the jetty right and it's beautiful then we go to sea uh maybe it was a wednesday that was a wednesday then thursday we had uh, we had a barbecue we had a banding on the flight decks we had a few beers we had steak and lobster and whatnot and then the friday we got in we got into boston and it was club 282 so that means there's a bar it doesn't always have to involve alcohol of course but it's just a social gathering and then the hangar opened up. We had Club 282, and we had a band playing, and there was a few wets going around. And he's like, this, this Navy gig's not so bad, right? <laughs> and then Saturday, my thing was, well, slippers and uh, house coats at 10 o'clock, and it's Caesar Saturday. <laughs> so I'm going to make a pipe. Here, there, Cox and speaking. All chiefs and petty officers are required. Chiefs and petty officers now dress <laughs> house coat, slippers, or appropriate sleeping attire. That is all. And then the Sunday, you know, you go do your thing around town, have a good time, see what you can. And then you socialize and have a few moose milk on Sunday. And from that moment on, he said, this is the greatest organization I've ever been part of. <laughs> and he could have been on the recruiting poster for the Navy, even though he was an Army one. <laughs> oh, really good. Because you know what? It's just, he was, they were slagging us. He right. told the worst thing about us. And you know, we're 
we're pretty good folks. We're just down, down old boys, <laughs> girls, trying to do our job. Exactly. Okay, so that's a good point. Now, so he could have been a recruiting uh, poster. Let's let's go back to the beginning here. Let's. You've had a great career, no doubt about it. I mean, you've had fun along the way. You can sense it. I can sense the excitement in your voice. When you talk to so you've had fun along the way. I mean, clearly a remarkable leader to make it to the as far as you have in the Navy. You're, you're motivating people. You're inspiring people. You're open to sailor third class, you know, reaching out to you and helping everybody along the way. That's fantastic. And, and it's uh, – it's to be saluted. Uh, it really is. Tell me now, if you had run into yourself, second floor up there in Eaton's at the recruiting yeah. center in Moncton, what would you say to yourself? What, what would you say to that kid right now if you met him? Steady the course. Keep doing what you're doing. You're going to love it. It's an outstanding. <clears throat> you sign up and to be in cadets or whatever, you have no idea what you're getting into. Let's not go kid ourselves. But I'd say, you know what, son, you're doing the right thing. Carry on. Keep your head held high. And use my number one priority even now is have fun, whatever that looks like. Jerry, your thoughts? Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting when you reflect on, you know, at our age now, Alan, Dave, <clears throat> reflecting on what you were like years ago. Uh, it's just state of course is right, you know. Um, I'm going to get into uh, a question that, I know I like the leadership question. I, I think what you've answered, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I'm going to ask you a little bit of a tougher question, and I'm a big supporter of the Navy. One of the challenges, Dave, that I see is that the, the, the number of visits to the various ports in Atlantic Canada, what I don't know is how many there are, and I'm not asking you to list them all, but I know in the port that I'm in, in St. John's, it seems to me that the visits are a little less frequent. Now, COVID, excuse yeah. COVID, uh, but what, what could you tell our, our viewers about the potential for maybe more visits? Does the government need to free up money? Do you need private sector guys like me to start emailing? What, what, what could you shed some light on to help us understand, you know, circumnavigation of the island of Newfoundland, <clears throat> up Labrador, I don't know. Is there anything within the leadership ranks that you can actually divulge here? Uh, absolutely. It's a great question. I'm glad you asked that because I didn't think about it, by the way. So the COVID environment has given us, one, it's given us limitations and constraints. So two, now we have to think outside the box and you know what? Canada and the Atlantic Canada and the islands of West, pretty, pretty darn good places to visit. So it's actually Tom Lazard from St. John, New Brunswick. He's the formation chief east. I said, Dave, we're in a bubble. This is back in the bubble days. Why are we not having ports, foreign ports, so to speak, right, within the Atlantic bubble? And I said, I have no reason to not bring that forward. And we brought it forward and right away the cracking was, that's awesome. I'm going to look right into that. He went to the CDS. And we had Halifax, I can't remember, Toronto, it was Toronto, on her way back from overseas reassurance and close liaison with the people in St. John's, with the mayor and everybody else. They stopped in there because, you know, COVID restrictions, it was still the bubble at that time. So they did that. So absolutely, it's a great question. It's a great idea. And if we don't learn from COVID, which I know we already have, but we have to continue to, Let's let's put bucks back into our own neighborhoods. Let's see our own places. I don't know when the last time we had one up in St. John and Brunswick was, but Tom would love to go there and see his old stomp the ground, right? And it's very doable. So yeah, we're gonna to continue to look into that. Absolutely. Well I, I it, appreciate Yeah, it, it, that's a great question, Jerry. And it's funny, the Navy I have to tell you, the Navy is thinking outside the box in this COVID environment. There's no doubt about it. I look at my own personal experience over the summer that my son joined the Navy and boom, COVID comes and everything gets shut down. There's no training happening anywhere. So here's a kid enrolled, ready to go away for basic training, excited. And you, as you know, like this is a crucial time. You don't want to, you don't, you want to capture that interest and that enthusiasm. And what does the Navy do? Well, lo and behold, they pool together the Atlantic bubble and they hold a, a recruit training in St. John's, Newfoundland. Brilliant. What a yeah, great yeah. idea. I mean, that's thinking outside the box. That's fantastic. Chief, we're wrapping this up. 
And uh, I know that you t you gave yourself a piece of advice there, that young say that young kid that was on the second floor at Eaton's in Moncton. You gave him some advice. We've got a pretty you know large audience, growing all the time. Uh, it's global uh, in nature, and uh, you know we always ask our guests that have been they're very accomplished people like yourself uh, have been through a lot of great things and uh, have done amazing things. We always ask to leave our audience with one small takeaway. What would that one piece of advice that you would give to the audience that's listening from a guy who's, you know, been in a little bit of trouble, okay. been successful, done well, and is now near the end of a wonderful journey in the Navy. What's that one piece of advice? What a great question. It actually makes me emotional, makes me reflect because I know the time is coming to, to an end within about 18 months, but, but that's okay. I'm happy with that. My advice is, you know what? There are many organizations out there, Al, Jerry, so thank you very much for your continued interest in us. The CAF and the RCN, yeah, I'm biased. I'm 100% biased because I grew up a little kid and now I'm the command chief of the Royal Canadian Navy. I love it, but I haven't loved every day, like I say. Because you know what? If you're in a job that you love every day, sign me up. Because they don't exist. What I love most days and the amount of change I've seen happen, we've become a heck of a lot better organization, more inclusive, more understanding, more open. So you know what? Give it a try. Give it a try. We are not perfect. Far from perfect. But I guarantee we're a heck of a lot better than a lot of other ones. And those people that aren't perfect, I got my boots shined up and kicked them the hell out. <laughs> there you go. Well, Jerry, I think that that's a wonderful way to end it, especially when your son's about to join and mine just did. Uh, this is fantastic. Uh, Chief, I can't begin to tell you how honored we are to have you on the podcast with us. It was wonderful getting to know you. It was wonderful having a conversation. And uh, it's amazing what people from Canada can go on to achieve small parts of Canada, right? Small parts of our country where we look to and sometimes they're often forgotten about. Not a lot of people know about where you come from in New Brunswick, but there you are. You're doing an amazing job for our country. You're doing an amazing job for our Navy. We really appreciate you being on Gale Force Winds. Thank you very Al, much. Jerry, thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. God bless you both and happy New Year. And Jerry, I believe it's safe to say the world needs more Dave Steves. <laughs> Never thought I'd hear those words. <laughs> <laughs> See you later, guys. Cheers, gentlemen. Thank you so much. Thank you for tuning in to Gale Force Winds. That's Gale Force Winds, W-I-N-S dot com.